And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. He is a, he is a well he is a well he is a novelist with a well regarded history, and is and is now breaking into the the realm of ta of tabletop with thrones and bo with thrones and bones, Nordengard. Got to make sure to get the proper O with this one. And and and. A man who's also who's also the brainchild of the Thrones and Bones tri trilogy, the one and only Lou Anders. How you doing? Today, hey, man? look at me here, and you roll the R. I'm impressed. Um, I this is not this is not my first rodeo into and in, into anything <laughs> um, Norse. Plus, there's the fact that I like Smortabrod. Um, if you've if you've had if you've had that before, I have not. Um. It's a it's a kind of open face on rye sandwich. It's fa it's fairly popular in um, Denmark, mm -hmm. and of course of course Denmark would have a flat sandwich because Denmark is flat as a pancake. The highest point in Denmark is the Czech Republic. <laughs> um, but I'd like to start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um. With that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oh, wow, my first introduction to role-playing games. Mm -hmm. That would be the box set in 1976, I think. I um, I was about 10 years old or so, and I, my parents, uh, we saw the box set for Dungeons and Dragons at the local hobby store. And uh, they bought it for me, and we took it home, and I started playing with my friends, and I was just head over heels. I, I uh, was a big reader of uh, things like Michael Moorcock and Fritz Leiber and, and a little bit of Robert E. Howard and things like that, mm -hmm. and, and, of course, Tolkien. And uh, just, just was, it, it stuck immediately. It stuck immediately. And about six months into it was when the satanic panic started up. And it reached my church, and they were like, uh, you know, D and D is satanic. You shouldn't do it. And my parents came and said, "Should you be playing this game? Is it satanic?" And I said, "Well, it doesn't matter if it is or not, because I'm hooked, and you bought it for me, so we're we're not we're not stopping." And I played everything that TSR put out: Top Secret, Gangbusters, Star Frontiers. If you remember that. Um, oh yeah, I yeah, yeah. I um uh, I did a Root Hill, of Gamma World. And then I, uh, and on Call of Cthulhu, then we got into the first edition Call of Cthulhu and played that heavily for a while. And then I stopped and didn't play for a long time after that. And then, and then uh, in the, I guess it was the early 90s, the Victory Games came out with the James Bond role playing game. If you, That's it, what it, I haven't only, heard you know, in a while. <laughs> oh, yeah, they only had the license for a couple of years and then it got pulled, but they put out a, they were incredibly prolific. They put out a ton of stuff in that in that short window, and that just blew me away. And it was the first time too, I think, that anybody, someone, someone, someone who knows more about the history of role playing games is going to correct me on this. But it was the first time I had seen the concept of having any kind of fortune or fate point that could uh, affect die rolls. So uh, you know, you'd spend them to. If Roger Moore runs across the street, and he's he's not going very fast, and every machine gun bullet misses because he's just. I think they call them fortune points. He's casting those fortune points right and left to downgrade everybody's shot, and I loved that game, and uh, and and played it heavily for a brief period of time, and then I got out of it again, and then I spent um, fifteen years as a science fiction and fantasy editor and art director. Uh, for adult science fiction and fantasy. And I started uh, noticing that a lot of the writers that I worked with also wrote for role-playing games. And uh, not only that, but the ones who did work in the role-playing game industry maybe had, uh, I don't want to disparage anybody, but their stuff felt more imaginative or more current than some of the people who didn't. And so I started buying up RPG manuals, you know, quote, just to read, end quote, and uh, 
had quite a collection before I admitted that I was going to play again. Mm-hmm. And then I came back in when uh, Evil Hat did the the Fate uh, Core Kickstarter and uh, played Fate for two years. And, and by this point, I had become a children's book author with my little Frostborn. And so I we played a Fate game for two years set in the world of the novels. And I tried at the time to do a, a Fate-powered adaptation of the books as a game, but that didn't get off the ground. And then I finally, my kids got a little older. They wanted to play something with more crunch to it. They... You know, they're always asking me, how much treasure do we get? And I'm like, well, it doesn't really matter in this game. And so we we decided, we we debated about what to play, and they wanted to play the, the Ur RPG Dungeon Dragon, so we started playing. And and then it branched beyond my kids, and I pulled in a whole bunch of other people, and uh, a few years ago I started, I'm, I'm very, very fond of Shadow. Uh-oh, I apologize, there go the dogs. Hold on, let me take care of that. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, folks. Um, dog problems. So I was going to say I'm a big fan of Cobalt Press and their Midgard campaign setting, and I started uh, uh, several campaigns in that world. And then um, I, I can't I can't enjoy something without trying to inveigle myself into it. So I started writing stuff for Cobalt Press, and I've written several adventures and done some mechanics for them, and uh, uh, over the last maybe two or three years. And then finally, the pandemic gave me the uh, opportunity to go back to the idea of trying to do a game set in the world of my books. So in March of 2020, I thought, what if I just write like a little short 20 or 30 page adventure set in the world of the first novel? And that's all I'll do. And I'll, I'll just ease in with that and see if I can do it. And, of course, that turns into two volumes. One's going to be 232 pages. The other's going to be about 150 pages. And we did the Kickstarter last March, and now there's a soundtrack and several VTT map packs and a 3D printing <laughs> edition. And, and, uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's gotten quite, quite bigger than that, than that initial idea for a 20-page adventure. You raised um thir- you raised just shy of thirty thousand dollars on in- on um on Indiegogo and according well it was it was to, according to the pages the reverse, it was, it was uh, on Kickstarter we did about we did twenty eight thousand dollars and then we've had a, a little bit more on Indiegogo and to follow up okay okay so Indiegogo doesn't make that clear <laughs> um, yeah it's a little confusing they say you raise this but then it says it, right below that it has this sentence that says it's like you raise you have, you know you have five hundred how many backers and then right below it it says five hundred and x number of which were on another platform. Yeah. Yeah. And now with now Pika now um Norn now Norngard is obviously very very um very much inspired by Norse mythology, um and. In all in all fairness, this is not the first rodeo I've had with um, RPGs and and Norse myth because they go because they go together very well. They have for for uh, decades. Um, but what what's the appeal to you when it comes to Norse myth? Well, it it you know it, it it's it's kind of I can I can approach this from several angles. You know, one of them is that I think my earliest contact with it was in the original edition of Deities, Demigods, and Heroes for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And they had the Norse Pantheon statted out. And there's a picture in there of Thor pounding the world serpent on the head with his hammer. And that artwork, you know, artwork is very often the doorway into the imagination. And it it, that artwork just hit me right between the eyes and never let go. Um, when I started writing my own novel, uh, I, I had written two previous novels that didn't sell. And so I started writing a fantasy novel. And at the time, I was an editor of fantasy novels. And, uh, all, you know, all my friends and peers were, were writers, some of them quite successful. 
and I was very confident in my editing, but I wasn't confident in my writing. And I thought, well, I'll just pick something easy, and I'll pick like a little snowbound land that's at the edge of, of a bigger world, and I won't worry about that bigger world until I get there, if I can even do this. You know, I'll ease my way in. And I, uh, it goes back to... Um, I was always fascinated by Robert E. Howard's The Frost Giant's Daughter. Mm-hmm. But I'm also, uh, as a kid, it you know, for those who know the story, Conan, or don't know the story, although I'm sure most of your listeners do, Conan wakes up on a battlefield, is the only survivor, and sees a beautiful woman who tempts him to chase her, and he does. And then her two brothers are giant frost giants, and they step out and attack Conan, and he kills them both and chases her some more. And then her father, Ymir, carries her away. And he was trying to do something like the Greek myth of Leda and the Swan. And he succeeded in that. Now, just like Leda and the Swan, if you from today's reading, it's a pretty sexist story. Uh, but as a kid, I just thought it was grossly unfair that her brothers were tall and she wasn't if she was a frost giant too. And uh, that was bouncing around in my head. And I wanted to do a story about... Uh, I figured that if, she, if she's not giant, then she must be a half giant. And I wanted to do a story about a half-giant girl, but I wanted it to be, um, you know, from her perspective. And uh, I wanted to write a, basically a female Conan, a strong female character who is half-giant. And so I started from that perspective, and as I started writing it, I realized I really needed to know the culture. And so I stopped plotting and just started world-building. Mm-hmm. And I, for shorthand, I would look at what actually happened in, in, in Norway... And then, you know, uh, if I can invent an adjective, fantasify, fantasify it. <laughs> and, and when I did, I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, uh, they, they're, 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 going, they're raiding England right now, so I need to have a fantasy equivalent of England. Okay, they're raiding Ireland. I need a fantasy equivalent of Ireland. Oh, look, they're raiding Russia, and they're traveling to North America, and they're, and they're raiding Constantinople. And before I knew it, I had written about 40,000 worlds, at 40,000 words of about, I think at the time, 20 countries and worked out languages and religions and, and histories for those countries as well, all just so I had better understand my Norse peoples. Mm-hmm. And that's not the way I would recommend writing, by the way. And, uh, and so I had, I had done all, I had, I had about 40 to 43,000 words before I went back and, and, and blotted the book. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was always on the back of my mind to do something with all that material. And so it, it's uh, made its way into the campaign setting now. All right. Now, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, oh, with a lot of... Um, with, with a lot of attempts at, at Norse, you de- um, there's, there's been different interpretations... Um, regard regarding it, um, right. One 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 recent example would be um, Z- um Zvieland, yep. which is is for, is is leaning far more into the supernatural end of things. Mm-hmm. What with the what with the presence of um of the of the gods be, having far more of an active hand sp- and in particular um Freya and Hell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. If I if I recall correctly, the um, the approach the approach that you're the approach that that you're taking aside from the whole thing with the uh, giants, um, you're lean I think you're leaning into a little bit more of the sword and sorcery interpretation of Norse myth. Possibly, I I, I definitely think there's a strong Fritz Lieber uh, vibe that runs through my my writing, but. Uh, I think that you know I, I've seen Svealand, and I think it's wonderful. It's it's. I think that some of the things that 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 differentiate me from some of the other Norse RPGs is that um, one, this is coming through the filter of my books. Now, the, the books are are intended to be children's books for eight to twelve year olds. The game is not aimed at that audience. The game is is marketed at adult gamers, and it, there's nothing in it that, that would preclude a child from playing it, but it's not aimed at children. But, but it's still drawn from the world of my books. It's drawn from and expanded 
greatly from the world of my books. So it's already Norse one removed. So I don't use the Norse pantheon, for example. I have my own pantheon that is inspired by the Norse. And in some cases, the serial numbers, you can, you can see what serial numbers have been filed off. In other cases, it, it steps a little further afield. You know, we have a, a different creation myth. Um, it's, it's also the people of this world are about 200 years past their raiding days. They've actually, uh, if you were going to pick a time period that was analogous to Earth, it would be closer to the 1400s. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're still living like they're in the 900s because they resisted being assimilated into the, the larger continent the way that Scandinavia was Christianized. Mm -hmm. So they're still largely living like it's the 900s for them. But... Um, but the, the technological level of the rest of their continent is closer to the 1400s. And uh, in fact, what's happened is they've been, taking, they've been taking geld payments for years for not raiding. And one city out in the West has started raiding again. And the king is supposed to do something about it, but just turning a blind eye because he doesn't want to jeopardize the payments. But so the other thing I think is that I'm, I hate monocultures, uh, with, with the exception of Hoth from Star Wars, which is wonderful. I hate it when uh, a book or a game or a movie uh, has the, 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 the planet where everything is the same. And, or, or the book where, you know, there's the village, there's the mountain where the witch or the dragon lives, there's the woods. And you get the sense that it's 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 the Wizard of Oz that there's nothing to the left or right if you step off the Yellow Brick Road, you know, that the world is just going to disappear if you walk more than fifty yards away from where you're supposed to be railroading. And I I like, you know, in, in real life there's no such thing as a culture in isolation, and uh, and so this this Norse country of Nordengard is at the edge of a, a continent that's 2,000 miles across and like I said has a, I think it's up to about 40 countries on it now and you feel that influence all over you know some of the weapons are, are from elsewhere some of the history is from elsewhere they've conquered and been conquered um, there are there's influences being traded back and forth across the wider world and, and my hope is that if this is a success that I will I will move eastward and start mapping out in RPGs some of those other lands. So it's not, it's, it's, this is Norse country, but this is not Norse planet, if that makes sense. Yeah. Now, with, the, with that in mind, <clears throat> would it, as much, as much as this particular, as much as this particular um, suffix has gotten overused over the past 30 years, would you say, would you say that? Would you say that? I was gonna say I was gonna say Norse punk, but really that does that um does <laughs> I don't think that qualifies. I'm just using I'm just using that, par partially be partially because of of the fact that things like the term steampunk started out as a joke. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um. But as far but for but for the for all intents and purposes, um. Somebody could go into Thrones and Bones um, without it, without any knowledge of the of the um, throne of the trilogy of books, and still, and still fit in. Absolutely, absolutely. That's something that's important yeah. to me because um, you know how Stanley once said that every comic is someone's first, and to a certain extent, yeah. I do think that can apply with role playing games. Obviously, if somebody's getting if somebody's getting Thrones and Bones first, I'd like to hope that they have some passing familiarity with the, with D and D. But um, <laughs> get, but given but, how yeah, it's being, go ahead. Well, I, I, no, I absolutely agree, and I didn't I didn't want this to be dependent on on anything else except you know the player's handbook or the basic rules. Um, but I think too, like just to the 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 the, the first book only deals with one city city of Bensa and for this RPG I had to come up with 10 cities and flesh them all out mm -hmm. and so I, I think it, in, in many ways this you know if you were uh, I mean I obviously I would not be upset if people who play the RPG follow it back to the books or if people who play the books follow it to the RPG but I don't think that's necessary to enjoy it at all 
Yeah. And I think there's there's so much more information in the RPG that was never in the books. It's really its own thing. Um, you know, it's got. Uh, oh, I think we're up to we had eighty pages of lore at the start mm-hmm. before I even get into the mechanics. Yep. Now, the campaigns the campaign setting book is. You've stated that it's going to have some. It's going to have some stuff when it comes to races, subclasses, feats, spells, and so and so on. Um, I'd like I'd like to focus on the races par- part first because whenever you're whenever you're doing a campaign setting, there's always the issue about whether or not you include all of the races or if some races that are in default simply yep. wouldn't fit. It as which is an argument I've had with different tables many times over the years when when a certain race that someone wants to play doesn't fit the setting that's that's actually being played and is and is listed in the primer (laughs) well you know when you when you when you yeah exactly i mean when you there are as many instantiations of the forgotten realms as there are tables playing in the forgotten realms um and and so i one of my pet peeves is when somebody on a forum asks you know is there gunpowder in such and such a country and someone responds is well there is it there wants you to be if if you want there to be and yeah of course obviously but he this person asking the question obviously wants to know what the official lore is so for some people they don't care about the official lore but some people the fun is digging into it so for the person who's asking the question Clearly, they fall into the latter category of someone who wants to know and, and play according to the lore. So I find that answer of whatever you want it to be to be flippant and, uh, and irrelevant because they clearly want it to be in line with the lore. There's, but that being, there's, one, there's, yeah. also one other, there's also one other thing when it comes to that kind of answer that, ma- that makes it real. The whole, the whole, oh, the whole oh, oh, it's your table. You can do, you can do whatever you want. Um, my mentor would often say, just because you can do everything, just because you can do anything you want at a table, doesn't mean you should do everything you want. Um, <laughs> yeah. And but it, um, the thing, you know, I can, I can easily see somebody asking that question because they want, they may want to, they may want to have some sort of baseline to know how to know how far how far they should how far they can stretch it. Yeah. So you know, it, it, I, I, it, at the opening of the mechanics chapter. Uh, or and also at the bestiary, I talk about what is and isn't in the setting, and I say, you know, it, it, you know, this is this is the default that you can you can do whatever you want. But in in this particular setting, uh, there are no halflings, and the reason for that is because it comes from the setting is drawn from the books, and in books you can't get away with using hobbits. <laughs> the Tolkien estate will come after you, you know, and uh, and there are no uh, what there are no orcs mm-hmm. because. Um, even as a kid, it bugged me that the orcs were just irredeemably evil and they all ran into the forest and none came out. And I said at the time, if I was going to have orcs in any fantasy of mine, they would be the most sophisticated people on the planet. And you don't get this in the first book and you don't get this in the RPG, but in the second book in the trilogy, you meet the Uskiri Empire. And the Uskiri Empire are basically orcs that have... Uh, they were they were nomadic tribes that got organized three generations ago and are now the largest power on the continent and they're conquering everybody they're not doing it because they're savage they're doing it because they honest to god believe that their way of life is more sophisticated than everybody else is a barbarian and and they conquer and they kill all the leaders and then they build schools and libraries (laughs) but that doesn't they don't they don't they don't get a we're not there yet in terms of the rpg that'll be the next book hopefully but uh, so no orcs, no halflings. Um, the the and then the elves divide into five sub races. We mentioned two of them: the wood elves that are not native to this setting, but are a, co- a country or two over, and the dark elves, who are the Svartalfar from Norse mythology, and they are pale, white-skinned, and black-haired, live underground. They're not drow. They are um, sort of uh, there in the way that the drow live in very Italian Machiavellian t- 
type societies, mm-hmm. the Svartalfar are much more Germanic. They are they are the worst appropriations of Norse mythology by the Nazis. And they have a secret police, and most of their people probably live in terror of their own rulers. And their secret police is run by an organization called the Underhand, which is like the KGB or the or the or the or the um, the Gestapo. And the Underhand are the only ones allowed to leave, and they go in on covert missions into the world above. All right. Well, that's um. That's a that's a couple more varieties of elf for me to hate. <laughs> yep. Um, simply simply because simply because um, well it's, it's a run, it's a run, it's a running gag here, here in the temple that I that I hate elves. <laughs> um, to the to the point to to the point where to the point where there to the point where there are entire pages dedicated to elves in the book of grudges. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, if you if you can stand a pun, I've got a um, the the second volume is a volume of of seven adventures that tie in that that expand the sample adventures, and the first one is called from Savartal Farheim with love. Um, and to be fair, to be fair, I don't I don't hate I the hating of elves thing is just, is just a running gag. It's yeah. no, it's nothing more than that. Um. But when, but when it where when it comes, to, given the fact that you had mentioned giants, um, mm-hmm. is one of the races that you're that you're going to be adding a type of giant or something? Uh, giant one of the races giant? is a half giant, and I, I I in the book the lead character is half giant, so I couldn't avoid that. Although also in the book, she's the only one, so. Uh, if somebody, you know, and we've had several playtests, half giants prove really popular. So I guess there's more half giants popping up now. But um, that's one. The races we just we just um, dwarves are mentioned, but you can use, you know, I I I, I tell you what existing dwarf types mark m- match onto what parts of the world. Mm-hmm. Then you have wood elves. You have the Svartalfar elves, the half giants, and then the last race I added was a last minute addition which is the huldra folk and uh i had huldra in as a as a monster in the bestiary and i wasn't gonna make a a huldra player race and i did that late in the game and are are you familiar with huldra somewhat but go but for the purpose of the audience go into it absolutely so they were um they they're 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 a fey creature they appeared like usually women. There are men called Huldrakal, but they're typically, when they're encountered they're t- in, in the mythology, they're typically women. And they have a hole in their back that's described as looking like the cavity in the trunk of a tree. And then they have a, either a cow's tail or in, in like Iceland, it's a fox tail. And they like to pass themselves off as people. And if you point the tail out and you're rude about it, they will beat you senseless with it. There's one guy who made fun of a Huldra's tail, and she whacked him so hard in the head that he was addle brain for the rest of his life. And, but if you're polite about it, then they appreciate it. There's a story about a guy who saw a Huldra, and her tail was showing, and he said, Madam, your, your petticoat is, is, is slipping out from under your skirt. And she thought that was so polite that she gave him a blessing that gave him good luck. And... Uh, so you know a fay that's easily irked, and um, and if they're if they're if they're found out, they usually disappear. And so I decided that as a race, they are passing themselves off as human. Now in the in the Norse mythology, in in a lot of the myth, you would, if you married a Huldra folk, her tail would fall off and her back would fill in. And in some in some versions of the tale, she would become ugly but would be a good wife. And I think it's probably a somewhat sexist idea that you marry the young woman and then she gets older, but it's cool because she's a good wife. And I, I, I left that part of it out, <laughs> but uh, but we kept the tail and the hole in the back. And uh, and for a, for a player race, they've got um, their type is Fey, and they have an extra feature called befuddling tail slap, which they can whack you in the face with their tail and. 
knock you dizzy. Mm-hmm. And it's um, that, and then um, if I can jump into classes for a minute, for, into subclasses, I, I, in, in Norse myth, there are these, uh, usually but not always women, called vulva. And they are cirruses that typically an older vulva will, be, will wander the land with a gang of younger women. And, um, and they carry a magic wand, a magic staff. Vulva actually means keeper of the magic staff. And, uh, and, and they, um, I, for a long time, I tried to make them into a wizard glass. Because of that magic staff, you know, I was just the image of the person carrying the big stick stuck in my head. I saw it's a wizard, and it was one of those things that was so obvious in retrospect. Where I, um, I was sitting there thinking about what they did and who they are, and I'm like, well, they control the weather, they shape shift into animals, they predict the future, and I realized, oh my gosh, they're druids. They're not wizards at all. They're druids. And, and part of it was the country over from, from Norengard is Arland, which is my Celtic country. And is totally, it's a matriarchal country with a huge, huge Druid college. And so I was just kind of saving Druids till I got there. And I'm like, no, they're Druids. They're complete. They shape shift. They control the weather. They see the future. They're, and they wander the land. They're Druids. And when, when I realized that and I quit trying to force the round peg into the square wizard hole it just opened up and in playtest the combination of huldra druid huldra vulva druid circle of the vulva has been really really popular and I'm, i think that may be the, the the best thing i've done in terms of classes and races yeah now when now speaking of that since you since you dipped into subclasses let's i want to get into classes because just as just as certain races um, yep. are can ha- can are are going to have issues fitting into certain settings, the same can be, can be applied just as well when it comes to classes. And with that in mind, are there any classes asi- aside from the non-core ones, artificer, that mm-hmm. you can, that um you would be that you would advise either not either not using or or in this or are in the domain of talk with your DM and players about it. Well, I don't have a wizard subclass. And I I note that in this culture wizards are very rare. There's there's one place where there's a glass blower who casts spells on his glasses and I it, it's mentioned in the lore that he's one of the few people who openly practice wizardry in the whole setting. And um so anyone who plays a wizard has probably come from some from a neighboring country, and not from is is not going to be native to Norengard, mm-hmm. and uh, is going to be dealt met with if not hostility at least fear and superstition. Um, I I I created three barbarian paths. We've got the path of the boar, the path of the wolf, and the path of the of the bear, for the three types of berserkers. And then um, there's a uh, another last the last thing I created was a cleric of the courage domain, and uh, then we have the aforementioned uh, circle of the vulva, which I'm really really proud of, and we have a shield maiden. The prerequisite for the shield maiden is that they need to be female or female identifying, mm-hmm. and uh, and then we have um, the rogue Svartalfar agent, which is basically um, the, and you know an agent of the underhand. Now somebody who played that in a group of other players who were not Svartalfar is either a defector uh, or is under really really deep cover, <laughs> which is totally possible. Um, and then uh, the last one, and I'm really proud of this too, is the Warlock Pact of the Norns. And Which is a warlock pact concerned with fate and and weaving the future. Which certain which certainly fits. Yep. Um. Now, when it comes to now, when it come with that in mind, um, one per, there's a few cl- there's a few classes that I'm 
that I'm curious if the, if they would work within the setting or if they might require a little bit of um, bending. Um, mm -hmm. Artificer is, def is definitely one I have a hard time seeing um, working in this kind of in this kind of setting just because of the tech level involved. Um, well, I would say like, again, like that's something that could have come in from another part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's not mentioned in this book, but I've you know I've got a and I've got a country called Thobovo, which is completely a country of tinker gnomes. Mm -hmm. So a tinker gnome from Thobovo who's got wanderlust could completely show up as an artificer. Yeah. But again, it wouldn't it wouldn't be something from from it would they wouldn't be native to Norengard. But again, because this Norengard is just one country on a huge continent, other subclasses can wander in. Would the same would the same kind of thing apply with say monks? Yeah, I um, I, I think that um, in my world the east is actually west, and it's not that far from from Norengard. Mm -hmm. uh, between them, there are two uh, arpeggios of mystical islands. And you have a string of islands called the Glistening Isles, that is that is Avalon. That is that is that is it's a place where the Fae have a the Fae can't come and stay. The larger the Fae, the 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 you know they have to have doors to get in from from the, their their land. And smaller Fae can go back and forth all the time through tiny holes in reality. But the really big Fae, or and, and big meaning powerful have to have big doors and the big doors don't open that often so big fae are limited in how much time they can come and how much how much they can and the druids in arlen have a lot to do with keeping them out and uh but there's a, a string of islands called the glistening isles that they have completely taken over like a beachhead mm -hmm. and it's the one place that they can stay year round they've made that into a, a part of the fae realm you know they've annexed it and I haven't, that is mentioned briefly in this book because it shows up on one of the maps, although it's more for later books. But what's not been mentioned is just west of that is essentially Monster Island, which is the same thing again, but for all the uh, spirits of, of Chinese and Japanese mythology. Mm -hmm. And then right past that is an enormous Asian continent that I've done a little bit of preliminary work on. So, um, in the, uh, you familiar with the Chinese treasure fleets? Somewhat, but again, this is, this will be one of those things okay. that asks that ask you. So it was during the Ming dynasty and there was an emperor who sent out a huge fleet of like a hundred ships. They went all over the world. They're really, they were not conquerors. They really were Star Trek Federationists. They were on diplomatic exploratory meetings of cultural exchange they wanted to go find new worlds and new civilizations and swap ideas and they went all over the world and there's some evidence they may actually have been to the americas and um and the the eunuchs in the in the temple and in, in the city in the imperial city were extremely jealous of the power that the commander of the treasure fleets had mm -hmm. so lightning struck the palace and they told the emperor that that was a sign from the the ancestors that this was bad and they grounded all the fleets and they stopped going and uh it, and that was the end of it but in in my world they they have the the, the asian continent of long go has um treasure fleets but they fly and in one of the adventures in the companion book the sagas of norengard book you meet uh, a guy who was a junior navigator on one of the treasure fleets and the ship was caught in a storm, and he gets in a, a basically a tugboat to go out and f fix repairs, and gets caught in a tornado or something, and crashes into a mountain in Norengard. Mm -hmm. And so one of the adventures is he finds you in a, in a city and says, you know, I really need help getting my this this the the motive device out of my ship. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've got a great piece of artwork that is a, a guy who looks like a cross between an Imperial Ming soldier and a Viking. Because he's been living in Norengard for three months, and so he's carrying a Jian, Jing, Jian sword, but he's carrying a Viking round shield, and he's got furs on over his uh, somewhat battered Ming Dynasty chainmail, and uh, the art for him is actually based on my wife's nephew. <laughs> well, the 
there is you've probably heard you've probably heard the old saying write what you know yep um, and well listen, and the whole, the whole thing the whole thing of you of doing art based on based on other people um that is that is that is that is extreme that is extremely common when it comes when it comes to artists I've noticed and um and well it, well most well, a lot of writers will put in some sort of um some sort of in joke or some sort of jab um the whole, that whole arose by any other name thing from Shakespeare that was him taking the piss out of out of his rival because mm -hmm. <laughs> the because the his rival theater was the Rose and that and they had sewage problems oh. I didn't know that. That's great. Was... Well, for us, we had we actually had um, in in the Kickstarter we had a higher level tier where you could become uh, a character in the book. Mm -hmm. And I had nine people who who become part of the Raven Guard, which is an elite warriors that protect the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a blast. I don't, I, it was a lot of work. I don't know if I'd ever do it again. I, I let them make. Um, the full-on characters with classes and races, and then I took those and turned them into NPCs. And so there's a chunk of about 10 pages in the middle of the book. It has a, a detail on their fortress and the nine people that live in it. But then we did a uh, another one. There's a there's a city called Trollheim where the Troll King lives. And trolls, you know, can have one or two heads. So obviously the Troll King has three heads. And we auctioned off the heads that we, you know, we had a higher level tier for the heads of the Troll King. And my sister-in-law in China very kindly backed so that her son could be one of the three heads. But I got the feeling that she didn't, she, her English is not that good. And I got a feeling she didn't know what a troll was. And she's too polite to tell me. But when, when the art came in, I could, I could feel her thinking, God, he's so ugly. <laughs> And so, I very quickly scrambled and put together another character that that could that could be more heroic, and that's how the the junior navigator imperial soldier ended up in one of the adventures. Yeah, it's <laughs> uh, it it I I can I I will admit I, I I will admit I wish I could have been a fly on the wall for that kind of thing just to <laughs> just to just to see the revelation of the of the art and feel the room get colder. <laughs> Oh. Well, it was it was through my wife and over the internet, so the the fly on the wall would have been bored. But it but it, you know, but it, it 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 allowed me to do what I love, which is to show that the world is not a monoculture. That yeah. you've got influences coming in all the time from other places, you know. And it uh, there's a there's a magic sword that's in both the book and the and the game. And um, when I created the sword in the books for my own purposes, I wrote out a thousand year history of the sword. Where it was created in one culture, and then it becomes the Excalibur of another country, and then it follows its way into Norengard and has a whole history there. And there's a scene where the 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 the, the boy, its co-protagonist, the boy protagonist, is carrying the sword, and the dra this dragon that he's talking to sees it, and the dragon sniffs at it, and just says, "That's not one of mine. That sword has a more storied history than you know." And I don't mention the sword's history anywhere in the book. But because I wrote the sword's history, I was, you know, when the, when, when the sword is carried into the dragon's lair, I was like, oh, that dragon's going to know that sword. And there's just an offhand comment about, about the fact that this is a, you know, the dragon knows the sword. And I don't go into any detail. But, but in the game, I got to put that detail back in. And this, this, the sword is like one of the most famous weapons in the country, and it wasn't even made there. Now, there's no, um... I, when it comes to when it, com when it comes to casters, you already you've already mentioned a couple casters and their presence within here, but there is there is one particular type of caster that has had a better luck recently than than it did in the past. That I'm curious if um if if it would fit within um Thrones and Bones and whether and whether or not um this particular ca type of caster would even have a presence, and that is sorcerers. Not to be confused with their horses, horsers. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I don't have a sorcerer subclass, but um, in Norengard, how would you be a sorcerer? 
It's the whole, the whole conceit with sorcerers is that they have they have some bloodline. They have, some, they have some blood. They have some Whoa, bloodline. Oh, okay. So there's there's a mention of one. I have a, a city called Arvik, mm -hmm. and in Arvik, the Jarl claims to be the son of one of the, of a goddess, mm -hmm. and you don't know. And he talks to her too. He talks to her all the time. You don't know if he's just insane, talking to himself, or if she can actually hear him. And in fact, she appears to be trying to convince him that he needs to challenge the high king and take over the country. And so far, you know, his his courtiers, his 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 house carls, hear this one sided conversation where he's o arguing against overthrowing the the country. And uh, and and it, and I have note that if you think he is mad or divine, depends on whether he he stats out as a a warlock or a sorcerer. You know, and if he's a warlock, who's giving him the power? Yeah. If he's a sorcerer, he's then he's he's got divine bloodline. But if he's a warlock, he's being played by someone somewhere. And so I don't I don't I don't answer that question. Yeah. Now, one of the one of the there's a couple of mechanics that you're adding that I am curious about. The first of them is, um. The, uh, is the honor mechanic that you're adding. Yep. Uh, what can you tell me about that? So that one um, is, I, I be, it is, is sort of inspired in part by the status mechanic from Cobalt Press and in part by the reputation mechanic in Paizo's Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. And it uh, just delineate, you have a starting honor and then certain deeds add to that. And you'll gain reputation, you'll gain notoriety. Now, honor is what the, the Norse would call it. It's really more like reputation because, you know, some of the things are not honorable <laughs> that they consider to be. Well, so honor is a weird word. Um, the other mechanic that I'm really proud of is, uh, well, I've actually got, um, I've got rune magic and I've got a resurrection mechanic. And the rune magic is something I had to have and it's been done. It's been done by several other people, and it's been done well. But when I looked at other examples of rune magic, it's 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 always like you find this rune, and then you've got the power of the rune. And the problem with that, for my setting, is that the runes were their alphabet. You know, you don't have to go dig down in the bottom of a pyramid to come back with the letter A. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not Sesame Street. You don't go, oh my gosh, I've been deep, deep, deep in the dragon's lair and I have discovered the letter D and no one else has ever found the letter D and now I have the letter D. So I had to have a, a reason that your version of the letter D had power, but somebody who's just writing a letter and uses the letter D you know, doesn't have access to that same power. And so it was about unlocking special knowledge that that is not for everyone and i took it back to you know odin hung himself on the tree for special knowledge and so when you die when, when you reduce to zero hit points and you're making your death saves if you are if somebody intervenes and stabilizes you and pours a healing potion down your throat this doesn't happen but if you make all three death saves unaided, you know, without magical or otherwise assistance, then you come back with the knowledge of a rune. Oh. And you've gotten the special knowledge from the other side of how to use that rune to do a certain thing. And then each rune has two abilities. It has the ability that you can always do with it, where if you draw or paint the rune on yourself or on somebody or on an object, then whatever ability it has applies for a period of time, and then you know that resets with a long, shorter, long rest or a long rest, depending. And then you've got if you actually carve or brand or tattoo that rune onto a person or an object, and in that case, the knowledge passes out of you and goes into the object or the person, and you get a permanent ability or a permanent boost, or 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 you've created a magic item. And then you've lost that knowledge because it's gone from you into the thing you put it in. Mm -hmm. And then the other mechanic I've got that I love is resurrection because, you know, you have a culture that's thinks that growing old is really, really sad. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you know, I, 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 if, if, you, if, you, if you don't die in battle, you don't go to Valhalla. And, and that's not a good thing. And although my, my, my people are about 200 years past their raiding days, so they're starting to, they're starting to shift that. They're starting to, to say that there are exalted places in the afterlife where people who have had, who've managed really big farms get to go. But, you know, it's in their blood that they want to die in battle. And, uh, and so, you know, you die in battle, you go to Valhalla, and then your buddies try and resurrect you. There's no guarantee that you're going to die in battle again. You know, they may be pulling you from Valhalla so you can die in, uh, 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 as an old man in bed. Mm-hmm. And so the, the higher, but, but the gods also are like, you know, if there's a first level character sitting at the table drinking his mead and he disappears to go back to the world, who cares? But there's like a 14th level character. Those are rare. We're not going to give those up as easy. So the higher level the character is, the harder it is to resurrect them. And at the really high end, if you resurrect them, you 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 risk that the Valkyrie are going to come try and take them back. Yeah, I can. And when it com- and that's cer- that's certainly that's cer- I can certainly see that. Um, and I'd rather not. I'd rather not get on the bad side of the of any of the yeah. Valkyries or their boss. <laughs> <laughs> um. But within, the, I want to, I want to, I want to bring up the honor thing because um, what I do, f- and you, you probably, you probably came down to this as well. Um, a lo- honor is a funny word because when a lot, the way that a lot of people think of honor is the interpretation that ha- the interpretation that came about after um, after the Enlightenment, right? Um. You know where, where where, and I'd say I'd say I'd say a lot of people's definition of honor is more is more in the vein of chivalry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. It it it's really these. You know, I, do you remember uh, Rome on HBO? I I'm I'm very familiar with stories when it comes to Rome, but at when that thing was airing, I didn't have HBO. Oh well, it it. There was when it was on. There was a. There was a. Uh, spoilers for. I guess it's okay to spoil something that's like how, years old. How How old is it? Oh gosh, it's, it's got to be like five or six years old now. Mandates right? passed. Yep. So uh, one of the main characters is sent to assassinate Cicero, and he goes there to assassinate him. And Cicero totally understands. You play politics, you lose. That's what happens. And Cicero asks for a few minutes to compose himself. And he says, sure. And so Cicero kneels down and closes his eyes like he's meditating or praying. Mm-hmm. And the guy says, you've got some lovely peaches in your garden. And Cicero's like, what? Oh, well, thank you. And he goes, do you mind? Can I take some back for the wife and kids? And the guy says, and Cicero says, sure, help yourself. And he gathers a, bus- a bushel of peaches. And then it's time, and he comes over and stabs Cicero in the stomach. And then he goes and meets his wife and kids at the picnic, and they go, how did it go? You know, how did the assassination go? He says it was wonderful. He was a really nice guy. He was not stuck up like you think a senator would be. (laughs) And and Salon.com had an article where they said that what most people get wrong about historical fiction is that they would have just made these people modern 21st century humans that had togas and Caesar haircuts, George Clooney haircuts, you know. Hmm. And that's not who they were. Their values were not our values. You know, they, they might be honorable people in their terms. But we, in the modern age, look at them like, oh, my God, what the fuck are you thinking? And, uh, and, and that, was, that was like the Vikings, too. I mean, it was perfectly fine to go get in a boat, go across the sea, and butcher people at church. <laughs> but, but, but if you stole from your kinsfolk, that was horrible. And how you reconcile those two things, I have no idea. You know, lying and cheating and stealing are horrible if you do it to your neighbor or your cousin. But if you do it to the English, who cares? Oh. <laughs> and it's the, just it's it's I so do, I do uh-huh. remember I do remember having to having to explain this kind of difference in something a bit more SF related because of the fact that um that pe- that a friend 
a buddy of mine is a big Star Trek fan, mm-hmm. and he had he had joked that it, that it seemed a bit ridiculous that um, Klingons will talk on and on about honor, and yet they're one of the two main main race main races in the setting that utilize cloaking tech and like to and like to do sneak attacks. <laughs> and the th- and it go it goes into that thing as far as th- as far as they're concerned it is it is still uh, it is still honorable to do to do that if they're do- if they're doing that to somebody who isn't a klingon exactly uh, and of course you know some of that has to do with the fact that when they when they created the klingons they had no idea what they were like i i, I got to talk with john Kulikos, who mm-hmm. played the first klingon and he said when they sat him down in the makeup chair and he said, what do Klingons look like? And the, and, and the makeup guy said, I don't know, you tell me. And <laughs> Colicos brought a lot of what became Klingon to that script. Mm-hmm. And, and they just took it. And, you know, in the same way that, like, Spock smiles in the first pilot. And, and a lot of what became Spock, Leonard Nimoy, worked out because he needed to know more about what Vulcans were like. And in the same way, Klingons were very much being built, you know, as they were writing but uh, uh, but like, yes, I do that. that's also because I'd say um, as much as, as good as Roddenberry was when it came to creating universes based on an idea, he wasn't a very good writer. Hmm. Um, and but, it, and Gene Alcoon created a lot of what we think about a Star Trek too. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of those people, I don't, I don't think get enough credit. But no, move, no. moving past that, there's a few, there's a few um, in-universe games. Yep. Within within um, Thrones and Bones that I'd li- that I'd like to cover, um, the first one is is um, and you can feel free to correct me because I'm probably gonna butcher pronunciation and I hope to God you've got a pronunciation guide in the books, um, Natalkir. Uh, Knatalaker. Knatalaker. That was Knatalaker, mm-hmm. and I don't have a pronunciation guide guide in the books. I started to put one in and it was huge, and I just couldn't. I I, I had to choose between. A pronunciation guide and an index, and more people ask for an index. And um, you made a smart choice in that because if you yeah, didn't put yeah. an index, I would have had I would have had to have you tanned. <laughs> yep. So I had to I had to go with index, which ate enough pages as it is. Um, but it, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is online. A lot of the pronunciations are online, and and a lot of it you can just fake. But uh, but it it. Um, Knatlanker was a, a sport that was sort of like rugby with baseball bats and fewer rules. <laughs> and it's um, it was highly violent, and they played it until only one person was standing. And the once everybody had been eliminated by being brain silly or dropped from exhaustion, then whoever had the most points at that point, that was the winning side. And I had some some knat like a rules and then brian suskin wrote the second adventure in the companion book and he didn't like my knat like a rules and rewrote them so um brian and i got together and and hashed out what the official rules would be and so he is the only uh the, the second book I, it's seven adventures four of which are written by other people the core book i wrote every single thing in it except for the knat like a rules which brian wrote And I should I should note that what <clears throat> what you're uh, what you're describing kind kind of reminds me of um, Clacco Storico Florentino or historical Florentine football, mm-hmm. which um, I guess it, it would be analogous to soccer except um, except full contact and bo- and bones will probably get broken. Yep, it, teeth smashed out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, People died. Games could last for like two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, now the other speak, speaking of which, the other the other one I'm I'm curious about is flighting. Yep. Which is supposedly all about insults. It is. It is insult comedy. It's insult rhyming insults to uh, to uh, score points over your opponent, and then I I um, when it when it uh, let me let me call it up. So you face off on it, and and then um, if you use it as a prelude to combat, 
Hold on, can we pause one second? I'm gonna, the dog is bumping at the door. Nice. All right, hold on. Go ahead. So if you use it as a prelude to combat, then you get to add um, a bonus if you're attacking that person mm -hmm. to your first two attacks. So you can like insult your opponent and then in a fighting match and then when you when combat breaks up, if you've demoralized them, then you get a you get a bonus that carries over at the start of combat. No. I, I Otherwise you just have like a charisma bonus mm -hmm. that lasts after that too. Yeah. But, um And so we have a we you know it, it, like it would not be uh, okay, well, unusual if um, you know you've just gone to to meet. I'm sorry, you can hear my daughter, <laughs> yeah. can't you? I'm sorry. Yeah. Hang on. Hey, y'all. Starting back. Mm -hmm. So, like a, a situation, and this happens in one of the adventures, is it wouldn't be unusual. Like if you the adventuring party shows up at a new town and they're introduced to the Jarl, the Jarl might have a favorite flighter that he wants to have challenge the adventurers as a way of sounding them out testing their metals seeing how clever they are seeing what kind of people they are and that then might influence how the meeting with the jarl is going to go based on how they comported themselves in the flighting match yeah now last but certainly not least there's the namesake thrones and bones which you yep. which you which you've um set which one of the reward tiers was allowing people to set up was get the um, STL files to 3D print this particular um, this particular game. Um, how did how how does this kind of how does this kind of game come about? What what would it what would some of its analogs be in terms of real world board games and um, what and what gave you the idea to do, to do a 3D printed version of it? So that one um, started in, from the books, obviously, because they're the Thrones of Monsters trilogy. And it, uh, you know, my 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 female protagonist is the half frost giant, and she's highly athletic, and she's a Knatliker champion. She grew up playing Knatliker with full on giants and not getting squashed, so she's really really tough. And when I created the male protagonist, who's just is who's human, I needed something for him to be good at. You know, and and it can't be ath athletic because that's taken. And so I had the the idea that that gamers, the Vikings love board games, mm -hmm. and that a, that contemporary gamers and historical gamers have the same kind of personality. So I wrote him as a game junkie, and uh, it was around that time too that they found that marvelous twenty sided dice from ancient Greece. And that I think that popped up on my feed like after I'd made that choice, and I was like, "See, see, gamers have always been gamers," and uh, and and the Vikings played a game called Hnefatafel, which was an asymmetric game where you had more attackers than defenders, and the point was to get the 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 central piece off the table before he's captured. And I originally was just going to use Hnefatafel. But we don't know the rules, and there are maybe three major reconstructions with a lot of variants. I mean, some Hanefetavel people have, have this, even like some people think it used dice, some people say it didn't use dice. Uh, the number of playing pieces, the number of squares, whether you can exit the board from any perimeter space, or whether you have to exit at the corner, or whether you can't be on the corners at all, are all things that are up for dis dispute. And so I'm 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 writing the book and I'm I'm planning on just cribbing from an epitaph and I realize that I really need to know what version I'm using. And of course right on the heels of that is well it needs to be my version. Why why use someone else's version when I have my own thing? So I stopped writing and I built a board and I played all these different versions and I would take like one rule from this version and one rule from that version and then I would play test them and then change it around and add a rule that I came up with that made it make more sense. And I put together this game that's not any one version of Hnefetafel, but it's certainly Hnefetafel inspired. Mm -hmm. And I made up some rules that I needed just for, for narrative purposes. And I, at the time, my, my two oldest nephews are, were chess champions uh, here in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And so I finished it and I took them to Starbucks and I bought them coffees and I put the game between the two of them and they played each other for three hours. 
and they loved it. And it held their interest, and they're, they were, they're both chess geniuses. It held their interest, but it also, they, they didn't break it. They didn't find anything wrong with it. Mm-hmm. And so I knew I had something. And so we printed the rules for that in the back of the first novel. And when I was going on book tours, it was great because I would meet kids who had made the game, and they would bring and show me the games that they'd made, and people send me pictures of the games they'd made through the mail. So um, the rules are also in... in uh, the Thrones and Bones RPG, and spoiler, if you're gonna play it, plug your ears. I'm a, I've been a fan of giant board game sets since I read A Chessman of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, and I certainly got a boost with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. So, the first adventure in the book, you have to f- participate in a life-size Thrones and Bones game. Um, but it, uh, but, you know, I got locked in, and so when we wrote the second book, which is set in different countries, my publisher said, so you're going to create a game for that too, right? <laughs> so I created board games for the second and third book as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully when one day we'll have 3D representations of those to tie in with other RPGs. But, it, um, but so I was talking about the fact that we were going to include the rules in the game, and my friend Mike Sheridan says, you've got a set for that, right? And I said, no. And Mike said, well, I'll build it. And he and another friend of mine named Andrew Mills, and both of them are wonderful at, at, at creating 3D printable stuff, collaborated, and they built this amazing 3D set. And it's got, um, it's got two modes. So you can print it out as a board game. But then, um, and, and for that, they have a, a faux wooden frame that you can snap around to make it look like a nice wooden frame that would sit on your desk. And then... That frame comes off, and they have an arena frame that snaps around it, which makes it this massive arena with stone seating. And for that, they've built LED torches to go in the corners. And so that's for when you want your your minis to have to fight for their life on a life-size Thrones and Bones set. Mm-hmm. Now, with all, with, all, with all that said... Um... I realize I realize that things are kind of that things are kind of in flux lately. But when it comes to at the very least the PDF version of um, of the Norengard campaign setting, um, what what would you be shooting for as far as a, a release window? Well, I'm I am things are not as in as much flux as you think. I just got today the hardcover proof from Drive Through RPG. And it looks gorgeous, and I see about 10 things I need to fix, including I've run the text too close to the margin, to the middle, on all left side, <laughs> left facing pages. <laughs> and I hope that's not going to be a hard fix. I hope that's an easy fix. I don't want to have to relay out this whole thing. But, um, but uh, given it was my first time laying out a book, I actually think it looks really, really good, if I can say so myself. But, um, I want to, I'm getting ready to send out the pledge manager. I've got uh, the companion book, like I said, has seven adventures in it, and I'm writing three of them. And I'm halfway through the final one. And so my, my timeline, here we are, it's August 26th. My timeline is to finish the last adventure next week and then send all the adventures out to the copy editor. And while that's going on, turn my attention to the, to the pledge manager and figuring out the shipping cost and backer kit. And if I can do it, then second week of September, I ought to be, knock on wood, sending out the pledge manager. And if I do that, then I will send the PDF of the first one out in the third or fourth week of September. And I'd like to do that for many reasons. I'm anxious for people to see it. I also don't mind having, you know, 567 eyes on it mm-hmm. before I commit to a hardcover printing, uh, just in case there's something I haven't caught, you know, and um, and get some feedback before before we commit, so so that uh, so the hardcovers are as perfect as they can be. I mean, it's been I, Misty Bourne who copy edits for Wizards of the Coast and Cobalt Press copy edited the first book, did a tremendous job, but. Um, uh, some there are a couple sections of the book that, that I got written after, after the copy edits, and I'm going over those over and over again. 
And I just, you know, like I said, always, it, it does not hurt to have a second set of eyes, and it certainly wouldn't hurt to have 567 more eyes, um, or 657. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I should be, knock on wood, uh, I'm certainly on time to deliver the hardcover in November. I might be able to pull that forward. I might be able to send the hardcover out in October. Um, I don't want to commit to that, but it's possible. And then for the second book, I can, I'm hoping I can get the second book in PDF out to people in October and, and keep on schedule for the printing of that one in November as well. It just depends on, um, on, on how much I can get done in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And oh. then Heroic Maps made beautiful, beautiful um, VTT map packs for the first and second books. And those are going to go out. Uh, I don't want to commit them. I think they're going to go out end of September, beginning of October. And we are, we can send out the 3D printable stuff now. Uh, so that'll go out probably on the heels of the PDF. And then uh, there's a guy named David Joseph Wesley, who's a Grammy-nominated composer in Los Angeles. And he's a Star Wars fan, and I wrote a Star Wars novel. So he started... Uh, following me after my Star Wars novel came out and we started talking and he's making a soundtrack and I haven't heard it yet but he promises me I'm going to hear something very very soon and then um, there's uh, a guy named Jacob Strout who does uh, streaming and Jacob approached me about about streaming the adventures and has uh, uh, put together a great cast and actually commissioned some artwork from some of the same artists that I worked with on the book. And so his podcast is going to start up, uh, I think it's around September 26th, mm -hmm. and he's going to be going through the adventures in the book. So, you know, that that gives me a nice date to shoot for, for having stuff out there so people can watch the streaming show. And then I said podcast, it's going to be a Twitch stream. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, people can watch the Twitch stream and then follow that, have somewhere to follow it back to. And so I should have it. I'd like to have it up for sale on drive through RPG, at least in PDF form around the time the, the streaming starts or, or soon after. Mm -hmm. And I'll certainly be keeping an eye on for it. But since, since you asked, since you said knock on wood, allow me to oblige. <laughs> but, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, if I'd known that, I would have opened something. I'll come back and I'll open a bottle. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.